This video is brought to you by Skylum, maker of AI-powered photo editing software Luminar Neo. See photos as you imagined them. Save $10 off the retail price using the discount code HU10 at checkout, valid when you purchase within two weeks of this video's release. Thanks, Skylum. Art is what artists make. So the process is to become an artist. It's not to make art. And that's the journey as a person, to get to a point where you are at ease with yourself, where you are open to all the possibilities, and then it will be rechanneled through you as an artist. So the process is actually the process of you. The process is working on yourself. Christopher Doyle, cinematographer. This is going to take a while, so strap in. Late one afternoon in the fall of 1941, as the legendary photographer Ansel Adams headed back towards Santa Fe with his son and assistant after a day's shooting, he was so struck by the scene unfolding before him that he slammed on the brakes, sent the car fishtailing onto the gravel shoulder, and almost ran into a ditch along the highway he was driving on near Hernandez, New Mexico. By the time he got his 8x10 field camera set up and had guesstimated the exposure, he was able to fire off just a single shot before the light and the moment were gone. Right. You know what I'm talking about, his most famous photograph of all, Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico. But do you know that it would take him another 30 years to feel he had finally, quote unquote, achieved a print equal to the visualization he'd had in that moment? Do you know that in order to reach that point, the canonical version of Moonrise, the one we know, is dramatically different from what was actually captured on film. That each of these prints required several minutes of heavy and complex manipulations in the darkroom. I recall something like 50, 51 different areas that had to be dodged or burned. But what does any of this have to do with you or me? Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to share with you how we think about the photo editing process. I will top it off by showing you how Skylum's Luminar Neo photo editing software can make that process simultaneously more powerful, easier, and cost-effective than more traditional tools used standalone or as a plugin, which is my kind of software. Of course, as I just said, this is a sponsored post, but if you know me at all, you know that this is not the same thing as leaving my intellect and integrity at home. So on to Brownstone's laws of editing, said with tongue firmly in cheek, because a video like this can only be subjective. First, shoot for the edit. When I take a photograph, I'm already thinking about the edit, which is to say, A, I'm thinking about what I want to achieve in a final image, and B, I'm thinking about how to minimize what I have to do in post to do it. Now, I was going to say Ansel Adams did this too, but I don't think that's quite right. It's probably more correct to say of Adams, he anticipated what he was going to need from the negative and the print to achieve the result he wanted. Back in the middle of the last century, as film photography rapidly evolved, this would have centered primarily on exposure, ergo his famous zone system. The reason I draw this distinction is because I think Ansel Adams must have really enjoyed that process and that much effort in the darkroom. Not me. I shoot with the edit in mind because, A, the less I have to do in post, the happier I am. I began my photographic journey in darkrooms, and I'd rather put a fork in my eye than go through that kind of trial and error, dodging and burning ever again. Hey, your mileage may vary, and that is absolutely fine. But I am so happy to have WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get digital workflow, from pre-capture to post-edit. B. The less I have, or anyone else has for that matter, to do in post, the less technically compromised the image will be. Exposing for less noise in the shadows, for example, or exposing to retain detail in the highlights I know I want in the final image. Finding the right balance in between. Composing for the keystone correction I know I want because I've pre-visualized the image even before I've tripped the shutter. Shooting with the intention of making color a critical element of the composition.
Although, black and white is my jam. It's why I prefer an EVF to all other viewfinders except in very rare cases. I see precisely what will and will not be in frame as I move camera and myself to where the framing works, and I can dial in exposure manually shot by shot by eye rather than relying on and taking the time to account for the limitations of any exposure meter, coupled with my unwillingness to allow 18% gray considerations to occupy mind share at the expense of artistic vision. It ruins my natural high. It's also why I buy the best glass, the best sensors, and the best ergonomics I can afford. I want my equipment to give me the shortest distance between intent and execution, the fewest aberrations with which I have to contend in post. All of which makes me happy when I'm shooting. My sense of character, which some of us define as lens imperfections which enhance the image, is instead predicated on what I see in front of me, how I see in front of me, and how I choose to frame and expose, which in turn in the end is about my character, that is, who I am made manifest through my imagery. But shouldn't this in the end truly be the case for each of us? Claudia and I think so, and this is how we teach our students. Second, editing is where the magic happens, which is to say, I value the edit no less than I value the capture. And I've had more time to think about it. It's where I transform my image so that, like Adams, I am certain it is not necessarily about absolute technical fidelity to what is captured by the camera, but instead it is about rendering what most closely aligns with how I felt the moment I tripped the shutter, how I saw it in my mind's eye, in my head, in my heart, in my gut, not simply on my retinas. Put differently, my aim in my personal work is to evince the joy, the awe, and the reassurance I feel when I walk the streets of New York, engaging with the environment and the people through my camera. And it is invariably the case that once in the back cave in front of my monitor, I quickly see how to amplify what's important and minimize or remove what isn't. Third, but what is editing? How should we think about editing? Well, I've just told you what I think is the purpose of editing and the guiding principle by which one can and ought to depart from absolute fidelity. That is, in consonance with your artistic voice in trying to make people feel what you felt when you took the shot. Now, most of us automatically assume that editing is the process of manipulating an image and using rule of thirds of the magic golden triangle pyramid Forget about that. I mean, at one level, yes, of course. Claudia and I tell our workshop students all the time, for example, that there is nothing wrong with cropping the crap out of an image in pursuit of one's artistic vision. I mean, Henri Cartier-Bresson cropped. Arnold Newman cropped. Who are we or anyone else to insist they were wrong? And while the dogma of no cropping on pain of death has its roots in the laudable goal of artistic discipline. It also has its roots in a much more mundane consideration, the limitations of film photography. The fact of the matter is that back in the day, enlarging an image beyond a certain point, which is, after all, the net effect of cropping, would quickly degrade image quality. But this is not necessarily the case with digital capture. If you use a high-resolution sensor, use stitching or embrace pixel shifting, for example. Although... 24 megapixels, even 20 megapixels, even cropped with none of these techniques can yield a beautiful 27 by 40 inch, 30 by 44 inch, or 34 by 60 inch print. We know we have them hanging on our walls at home. I have no qualms either, shooting in color and converting to black and white in post. I do it all the time. In fact, I almost always prefer using a color sensor to a monochrome sensor because the color channel information is preserved for my use in post, and I use it. I like bringing out the tonality, the interplay of shadow and highlights, as I experience them emotionally at the time I took the shot. On the other hand, popping color or removing entire subjects? Sure, I do that too, if only occasionally. If you don't like that idea, that level of manipulation, I understand, but you might want to talk to Steve McCurry, who has built an incredible career doing, among other things, just that. Although clearly one can overdo it, kind of like going haywire the first time one finds fonts in PowerPoint. 
And there are boundaries where photo manipulation veers into something profoundly wrong. Hold that thought. But when I say the magic is in the edit, I'm also talking about, before manipulation, curation, which has nothing to do with photo manipulation per se and everything to do with being critical in a be kind to one's self, born of curiosity and desire to grow kind of way. It took Robert Frank 28,000 images, for example, to wind up with the 83 that made it into one of the most important photographic books of the 20th century, the Americans. Our advice when it comes to curation is always the same. One, recognize that there is no such thing as objectively great art. Great craftsmanship, yes. Art, no. Because one's appreciation of any objet d'art, however it is consumed through the eyes, the ears, taste, smell, touch, is a conversation between the object and the consumer of that object, which in turn is a function of the sum total of one's life experiences up until the moment one interacts with that object. Two, recognize the difference between craftsmanship and unique artistic voice and pursue both. Three, recognize that very few of your images, anybody's images, as I just suggested, will resonate with people, well-crafted or not, who have not had the artist's exact set of life experiences, which of course is impossible, or who have not had a set of experiences which somehow combine to allow them to see and value the work as the artist does, or get excited by seeing the work very differently from the artist and still enjoying it, which is simply not a predictable thing. So, four, do not try to chase someone else's perspective or sense of what's art. Instead, pursue your own, even as you consider this quote attributed to Steve Jobs, but in fact, has antecedents dating back to the late 19th century at least. Good artists copy, great artists steal. There is nothing wrong, there is much that is right, in building upon the works of others on your way to finding and honing your own artistic voice. 5. Curate your images before you take them. That is, before the edit. Pay attention to your craft. Scan, for example, backgrounds when you shoot, so then when you see something that detracts from your intent, move, move with your feet to get a better angle. Another example, among many, if you happen across a scene that speaks to you, but you feel it is somehow missing something, park yourself there and wait for something serendipitous to happen. Six, with all of this said, once you bring up your images on a decently sized monitor and apply these rules, do keep images for later review, even if it feels like they violate the rules of craftsmanship. If you somehow feel it is right, you may be right. You may have something very special. Because hackneyed as it is, yeah, rules are made to be broken. And this can be the basis for a truly unique artistic voice. Which is why Claudia and I go to great pains not to teach orthodoxy in our photography workshops and one-on-one -on -one video mentoring sessions via Zoom. The most compelling argument for this I've ever personally seen comes from an art exhibition of drawings Claudia and I saw by Picasso and Dali. I think it was at the Met. It shouldn't have been a surprise, but surprised I was to see that the artists who did Guernica and the Persistence of Memory, respectively, were exceptional draftsmen before they established entirely new ways of seeing things. Seven, don't be overly concerned about how many keepers you manage from any single shoot. Do come to love what we call noble failures, that is, images from which you can learn and apply that learning to your next shoot, both in terms of craftsmanship and your artistic voice. Yet another subject for another time, although do look for yourself in your images. See if you can find your own values, your own preoccupations, what makes you tick in those images. If you don't, move on or do some more work on yourself. Because the reality is this, in the end, you will actually, or more probably should actually, be editing precious few images. And then, finally, there is manipulation in post. Cropping, grading, masking, adding, subtracting. And for that, let's turn to Luminar Neo. Because the thing of it is, if you're at all like me, the last thing you want to do is futz with your images in post. Get it right. Yes. That's joy. Futz with it. Mm. That is going through what is for me excruciating detail work to remove, say, dust spots on the sensor. No. No, 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 no. 
So, as I said at the outset, Luminar Neo is the latest photo editing software from Skylum, a Ukrainian company, by the way, hold that thought, which has focused on using artificial intelligence and solid user interface expertise to make complex editing tasks simple, like removing dust spots. brightening eyes. in skies. Neo can be used standalone, but can also be used as a plugin for Lightroom or Photoshop. Although, I should mention that we're talking Lightroom Classic only. Lightroom CC doesn't support plugins generally. Don't get me started on the two different code bases, which, that caveat aside, makes a whole lot of sense for those of us who have already invested in Adobe, I have, gotten hooked on their cloud syncing, I have, but want a more efficient way to handle those kinds of things. I do. Pretty cool, right? All without the kind of image degradation that is part of a Faustian bargain we have to make with, for example, most smartphone apps. The icing on the cake, Luminar Neo retails for all of 79 bucks. Although again, if you order a copy uh, through Skylum.com anytime during the two weeks after this video is published and use the discount code Hue10, you'll get 10 bucks off. Compare that to an annual Lightroom and or Photoshop plan from Adobe that begins at $120 a year. Uh, although you may well want the one terabyte Photoshop Lightroom plan for 240 bucks a year or $300 for a one and done Capture One license, $180 per year, including future updates. But as I implied at the beginning, it wouldn't be a three blind men and an elephant video if I didn't also answer the question, what doesn't Neo do or do particularly well? So let's get into it. Now I can't, I won't compare Luminar Neo function by function with all of the capabilities in Lightroom, Photoshop, or Capture One. That would be a fool's errand, but given how and what I edit, I can tell you this. A. Actually, I was going to tell you that the masking functionality of these high-end tools exceed what Neo can do today, but with the release of Luminar Neo 1.0.6 a little over a week ago, the masking functionality of Neo not only takes a leap forward, but as I've suddenly come to expect from Skylum, is more sophisticated than the latest masking updates to Lightroom anyway. I haven't worked with Capture One, so I can't really say. The last time I worked with it was three or four years ago.
B, the implementation of layers is more fully featured in Photoshop than what Neo can do today, which is no problem for me here. The nature of what and how I shoot is such that I don't use layers. And at least with Neo, you don't have to round trip layer editing the way you do from Lightroom to Photoshop and back. C, there is no cloud syncing service across devices, which by the way, was a huge reason I went to Adobe Creative Cloud in the first place. But again, no problem. I'm not exiting the Adobe ecosystem. Given my professional livelihood, it is a cost worth bearing. Though, if Skylim ever did offer cloud-based syncing, oh baby. D. Neo doesn't do exposure blending or panoramic stitching the way Adobe does, which is not much more in Adobe than a click of a button, and that function from Adobe is impressive. Again, generally not an issue for me at the moment because I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I've attempted either of these approaches. I use other means to get what I want, like very low ISO exposing for highlights, high resolution sensors, as I've previously mentioned. Although I will be looking again at exposure blending because, wow, the dynamic range of a New York City street can be astounding. E, the Behind the scenes AI inside Neo is sufficiently complex, or perhaps the team has not fully optimized the code base for the 48 GPU Mac Studio Ultra sitting in my back cave behind me, that there are times when it has to think for a few seconds, anywhere from a second or two to 10 or 15 seconds before the effect I've asked for pops into sharp relief on the screen. A little bit surprising, but I don't mind the wait, especially at the price, especially at the lack of futzing. In other words, all of these limitations are acceptable to me personally, either because they are irrelevant to me, my core tools handle them, or Neo offers me power and ease of use for things that do matter in a way that the big boys don't at a compelling price point. So there you have it, an abbreviated take on how Claudia and I approach editing and a look at a new photo editing tool I think is fascinating and worth taking a close look at. But I do want to mention one other thing. I support Ukraine, and Skylum, as I mentioned earlier, is a Ukrainian company. The individuals in that company have been hit hard, like all Ukrainians, by the Russian invasion, which is why, beyond their value proposition, I was actually quite delighted when they reached out to me. I have already made my support for Ukraine very clear in public. Check out, for example, my interviews with Jens Krauer and Alan Chin, photographers deeply involved in covering Ukraine on the ground. And while very few of us can actually be there, it strikes me that supporting a small Ukrainian software company is a profoundly good and decent thing to do. As is, for those of us so inclined, donating whatever we can, money, supplies, a bedroom. If you are so inclined, please do click on the open description link in the show notes below for links to charities providing real on-the-ground support to the people of Ukraine. We thank you for it. And that, for now, is that. This video was brought to you by Skylum, maker of AI-powered photo editing software Luminar Neo. See photos as you imagined them. Save $10 off the retail price using the discount code HUE10 at checkout, valid when you purchase within two weeks of this video's release. Thanks, Skylum. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below. Picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com. Sending coffee money via PayPal, or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.